Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and make sure your notification bell is set to all. It really helps me and the channel out. Thank you in advance. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. My story happened in 2005. Now, I wanted to share it with you. My hiking experience was this. I was solo camping at the Lake Dubonnet campsite west of the lake near Interlochen, Michigan. In the morning, I set off for a hike around nearby Lost Lake. Fitting name, don't you think? I realized after a short while, as I neared Lost Lake, that the forest was absolutely silent. Not a sound. No birds, not a squirrel, nothing. I felt like I had entered a sort of dream state, thinking, am I just dreaming up all of this? Why is the forest silent? As I kept walking, I started to hear the sound of, what I thought was, a helicopter coming nearer. I was confused by that, but there is a Great Lakes Maritime Academy in Traverse City, so I thought maybe a helicopter was flying back to town, I think. By that time, I had previously lived in Interlochen for two years and had never heard such a sound. But your mind tries to make sense of things. I kept walking and the sound continued to come nearer and then became deafening, as though it was buzzing inside my ears. At that same point, I then felt as though I could see behind me and that a bear was running up to charge me from behind and tackle me. At this point, the helicopter noise was super loud and I panicked, whipped around and nothing was there and the noise suddenly stopped instantly, and I felt like I had just woken up. I shook my head, super confused, looked all around me, including looking into the sky for a plane or anything, but there was truly nothing. I was beyond perplexed, of course. I wanted to get back to my tent and car ASAP, but I did not want to turn around and walk back past Lost Lake any more than I had to, so I kept going on the trail, which thankfully was circular enough to get me back to the campsite. I've never experienced that again, either in that exact spot or anywhere else. I guess I'll forever be puzzled. I watched Ghost Adventures and have seen people who've experienced similar things to my story, so that sort of makes me feel less alone. I would feel happier to hear of any other lost time experiences anyone else has had. This is not the greatest story, but it certainly scared the fuck out of me at the time. To set the scene, me and my buddy were driving along on a weekend night with some girls we picked up. My buddy is driving, I'm in the passenger seat, and the girls are in the back. We were bored as hell and somehow the topic of scary shit popped up. Where I live, there is a certain road tucked away in the back of the woods that follows close to some train tracks. It's extremely dark and infamous for a plethora of spooky shit, mostly stories about ghosts, but also stories of people being forced sexually, sexual assault, beaten, and murdered back on that road. So me and my buddy, being the brave manly men that we were, proposed we go there. They agreed. 
So we arrive at the beginning of the road and slowly make our way through the darkness and foggy road in the dead of the night. We drove about 15 minutes till we reached the end of the road, which led to the start of a more populated road. We weren't impressed, so we decided to go back through it. But this time, do something a little different. So we circle back, drive through the road again, and at about halfway through, my buddy decides to turn the car off and shut the lights off. We sat in silence for about 10 minutes, hearing distant, melodic sounds that seemed to be coming from all directions. The fog was thick, but we could still make out at least 15 feet in front of us. Me and my buddy are grinning ear to ear because the girls are getting super antsy and scared until we hear a boom. All the windows fog up immediately. We couldn't see shit anymore, like condensation on the glass. The girls started screaming. Me and my buddy were like, okay, let's get the fuck out of here. He turns the car on and peels out, trying to make his way through the fog and smoked windows. Eventually, we got to a road, but this time, the exit was blocked by a fallen tree, which scared us at the time, but didn't think much of it. We turned around and got out there. Fast forward five years, and one of my co-workers was talking about that road. He ended up saying how one time his buddies him and all of their girlfriends were there for willing. His buddy ended up going off alone into the wooded area, only to return later with the quad and running for his life, screaming Bloody Mary. They took no time to find out the situation and hauled ass to get the fuck out, only to find out the exit was blocked by a fallen tree. He locked it up and turned out Someone was killed back there after being trapped in a trees blocking the road. I never took the time to verify what he looked up. Maybe because I'm scared of what might have happened that night, if it's true. Or maybe I don't want to find out. It wasn't true, and my buddy just pulled the fast one. I still won't forget that night, though. Owen, oh, here's some extra stuff. Some extra story to go along with all of this. This particular road is pretty infamous, popular for ghost stories. One famous story is that an albino lives somewhere off the road, glowing red eyes and all. I've heard it's a cannibal. I heard he's friendly until he invites you in for some homemade moonshine. Either way, you probably wouldn't want to find out. And here's a little bit more information. The mystery road has been discovered, but it's actually not a road. My story takes place at Constitution Drive in Pennsylvania. In a video, this woman claims to have caught the most famous ghost story Constitution has to offer. The man and his dogs. Legend has it this man was walking his dogs one day when he was struck by a train severing one leg, leaving him fatally wounded, and he eventually bled out. There are claims that people see the man pacing up and down Constitution, walking his dogs, whose eyes glow red. Constitution is a really, really weird place to be at night. Tons of stories of strange, demented, and scary things are always told about that place. When you go there at night, you hear a strange noise, almost as if something is whistling to you a tune. This video captures Constitution perfectly. At 1.25, Consti starts playing her song. What occurred a couple years ago to me may seem nothing out of the ordinary to some folk, but what I felt that day, I have only experienced once before, and it made me feel something I can only describe as primal, for lack of a better word. I apologize beforehand if this ends up being long-winded, as this is my first time sharing this story. 
and I want to make sure I paint as accurate of a scene as I can. Also, English isn't my native language. My ex-significant other and I booked this amazing homestead of a vacation for two days and nights after reading a lot of very positive reviews online. It was managed by a very charming and hospitable elderly couple. Now, this homestead is smack dab in the middle of a huge, sprawling estate surrounded by coffee plantations on three sides, has its own private waterfall, and behind this estate are very large hills of which is owned by this couple. Every hill was covered in the woods. The accommodation provided to us was a quaint little cottage nestled between the main homestead where the couple lived and a, another larger cottage that has been occupied by a couple of tourists' families. The three buildings are surrounded by a very beautifully tended garden. A narrow path winds in from the three buildings and head towards the hills. The first day was generally uneventful as both of us were exhausted from the long drive from the city we lived in, and we just soaked in the hospitality and the amazing view all around us. The next day, we were given the option of heading to the waterfall or hiking up the hills, and my ex, after a lot of debate, chose the hills. So a little after 10 a.m., we packed ourselves a nice little brunch and headed out towards the path that led to the hills. The weather was cool, and a light bit of rain had kicked up the smell of damp soil that was invigorating to the soul of city folk. As we reached the end of the winding path, we were faced with hiking up a pretty steep climb directly up the hill or walk towards a now unpaved path that skirted around the hill. Since the rain had left the soil all around us pretty damp and the grass wet and slippery, we figured we could find a more gradual climbing spot if we skirted around the hill. So off we went down the unpaved path and about 10 minutes into the walk, the terrain changed dramatically. Instead of open land, we were now walking basically into a ravine, and the trees on both sides of the ravine basically blotted out the sunlight to a great extent. It was as if we were in the middle of the jungle all of a sudden, but unfazed, we still tracked on, hoping to find another way to climb up that hill, which was not visible anymore due to the terrain. After about an hour's worth of navigating through the ravine, we found that the path veered off into even more dense jungle ravine. We found that the path veered off into more dense jungle terrain on the left and on the right was a dilapidated old wooden hut that seemed long vacated. So as we took a breather to try to figure out what to do next, we were met with the angry barking of what I assumed was not less than seven or eight dogs, and the sounds were only getting closer. So we beat a hasty retreat back the way we came from. Once the barking subsided, we regained our composure, only to find tons of leeches trying to get onto us from the wet bushes and blades of grass. This freaked out the ex, and I had to run through the boulder-filled ravine to basically catch up to her. We ended up back at the steep spot of the hill, and by this time, I had had enough, but had to give in to her persuasion, and ended up climbing the steep part of the hill on all fours, getting dirt and grass all over to my relief, the steep bit gave way to what I can only describe as a meadow of lush green grass bordered on the left by bushes with sweet-smelling wildflowers, and on the right, an unobstructed view of gentle rolling meadows that actually had cattle grazing, but I didn't find anyone herding the cattle. So an hour and a half later of hiking through the meadow, we chanced upon a muddy path carved into a much gentle sloping hill. 
Now, this hill was huge, but the path made the climb much more forgiving. Upon cresting the hill, the other side of the crest is a sheer drop-off, but the view of the valleys below was nothing short of spellbinding. We rested and tucked into the food we had brought, all the while just admiring the view. And it was 2 p.m. by now. The crest of the hill was so high up that every time a cloud passed through, we were very absolutely drizzled on, and after a few minutes, we were greeted by the sun. This was heaven to a couple of city slickers. By 5 p.m., I was getting antsy to start to negotiate our way back down. As I didn't want to slip on the still wet grass, and I sure as heck didn't want to try my luck with climbing down into the darkness. After about a half hour of begging and pleading with my reluctant ex, I finally managed to drag her back off the crest and start our climb down. The first thing I noticed was the absolute silence. No birds, no chirping, not even insect sounds. We were losing light faster than we could climb down, and the silence was really getting to me. I looked around to see if I could see the cattle that were grazing, but no. Everything was deserted, and it was at this point that I felt like I was being watched from behind. The ex was behind me while we climbed down, so I asked her to go on ahead of me, and I would bring up the rear. In my mind, I wanted to put myself between her and any other person that would meet us from behind. But a few minutes later, I get the same feeling of being watched, not only from behind, but from all around us, except the front. All the hair on my forearms were upright. I was hypervigilant, almost bordering on panic. The ex didn't feel anything, but was creeped out by my behavior. Up to that moment, I had been cheerful, joking away and muttering everything I could think off but now I was unnaturally quiet as per her observation and extremely focused on getting off the hill and at the same time looking all around searching for someone. Before the silence and the sense of being watched hit me, all my mind was preoccupied with was to not slip and to look out for snakes. But now that was not a concern. I urged her down faster but didn't tell her anything as to not panic her and partly to not seem like a blithering idiot in my mind. I was ready to slip and slide down that hill if it meant a faster way down, but didn't want to leave her behind. After about half an hour of this torment, a new feeling crept over me. I felt anger from whatever or whoever was watching us. Like we were not meant to be there. Like we were trespassers. It was the complete opposite of the absolute bliss of climbing up the hill. And still, no sound. Not even a damn cricket to be heard. No wind, not even a breeze. Then, as if by some miracle, a dog appeared behind me. Had not seen this fellow when we climbed up. He was a thin, emaciated, brown mongrel who had his tail tucked between his legs and looked at us warily, all the while following us at a distance. Although the sight of the dog put me at a bit of ease, the feeling of being watched lingered on. Since I also didn't want to be bitten by the dog, I made the ex stop and give way to see if the dog would pass us by, and he did. He crept closer to us and wagged his tail while looking at both of us and passed us by, still a bit wary of us. And then the most curious thing happened. He would climb down a bit and then wait until we reached him, and would repeat this over and over until we reached the bottom of the hill. It was like he was escorting us to safety. I felt a slight bit of ease at last. Now focused on the dog and desperately trying to ignore the still lingering menacing feeling that was now behind me, 
I finally realized that we were now climbing down into the dark, and by the time we managed to get back onto the paved path, it was 8 p.m. and pitch dark. We were walking behind the dog, who was now wagging his tail away and walking closer to us, and much to my relief, I could at least see light in the distance. The dog escorted us all the way to our cottage, and while I was trying to find some food for him, he disappeared. Only when we got off that hill did that feeling of being watched go away. It was as if someone flipped on a switch and the sounds of insects was instantly all around us. I swore to myself to never again put myself in such a situation, if I could help it. When we met our hosts for dinner, they said they were actually worried as we were expected back by 4 p.m. and were trying to reach us on our phones, which had no network coverage throughout this entire ordeal. I didn't want to ask him about this horrendous experience that I had, but inquired about the brown dog and if it was theirs. They told me he is a stray and was known for escorting post visitors up to the cottage and then he disappears. He was nothing short of a miracle, a divine presence who guided us to safety. I know that some of you may think this was lame or that maybe I had anxiety. I have been anxious before as I work in a high-stress environment, but this was nothing of the sort. The feeling of being unwelcome, anger, and imminent danger is something that still triggers goosebumps when I reminisce. And to that dog, I am eternally grateful. The only other time I felt this way was when I was with friends on a jungle safari and our group was trailed and stalked by a predator. A fed bear. They behave, just not naturally. Unfortunately, the occasion ended in the old adage a fed bear is a dead bear, playing out. I went hunting two years ago with my dad and his best friend, my uncle. Dad and uncle had been hunting for 35 years. Moose mostly, sometimes bison or elk or caribou if moose didn't work out that year. So usually they buy a moose tag each and someone gets an elk tag or whatever, just in case. And every time, though they had never needed it, they've each brought a bear bag. One for black and one for grizzly. When we hunt, you are a full day's travel by boat before you'll see any civilization, sometimes two days. The only communication is by satellite phone, which only works sometimes anyway. Sometimes shit happens out there, and you have to be prepared. Now, sure, you can hopefully explain to the COs later that you had to kill the animal you had no tag for in self-defense, and hopefully they'd believe you. But if you just buy a tag, you can know you're safe legally to take whatever measures necessary for protection. But like I said, they've never needed those tags, not in three and a half decades of being out there despite all of their numerous bear encounters. So anyway, Dad knows an outfitter who has a small plywood shack out here, down the river, about 15 by 15 feet, maybe. He warned us that a buddy of his recently used the shack and had bear trouble, so he went out to line the outside with corrugated tin. We know our bear safety, and it's bear country all over, so we decide to stay. Night one, no problems. However, fresh bear shit on sight. Rifles up and eyes open. Chat loud all night. Smash big pieces, scrap tin together, so the ear-splitting, snapping booms echo off the hills. Next day, we are up early and out hunting. Not much luck, but we make some friends on the river. They made camp upstream by a slough we usually frequent, and we stop the boats to drift and chat a bit. 
Turns out, one of them knows the outfitter whose cabin we are in. He fills us in on a few things. Someone recently used it, had bear trouble, then decided to illegally bait the bear with hot dogs every night for a week in order to lure it into the camp so he could shoot it. Only he never committed. He just fed a bear. He made noise and stink and threatening actions, then fed the bear treat, actively teaching it that these things are safe and, okay, things that will result in food. Well, shit. We do some more traveling upstream, see nothing, back to camp. Trail into camp from the river marked by some spare jerry cans. We have full of fuel. One of them had been dragged into the middle of the trail and bitten in two places, punctured several times, and is still leaking. Rifles up. Get into camp. The grub stash had been broken into. Must not have locked it upright, or the culprit knew what they were doing from experience. Camp is a mess. Half the food is gone. Some emptied, torn-up plastic bags have been cached in a patch of moss behind the shack, and there's debris everywhere. Bear in camp. I'm ahead of Dad and Uncle, so I call it out as soon as I see the mess. There's still ice stuck to some of the bags that had frozen food in it. This just happened. I know the bear is here. He's likely watching or listening to me right now as I'm scanning the area, unable to see the damn thing. We clean up lock up tighter, store stuff into the boat, and start pissing everywhere, making more noise, shouting, hollering, smashing tin, foghorn. Scare that fucker away is all we cared about. I looked around more to try to find out what exactly we were dealing with. The ground in camp is all moss and sticks, but if it bit the gas cans at the trail ahead, then it may have come down the beach where there was sand. Found the tracks I was looking for, but couldn't decide where they were from. Claws out suggested grizzly, but they were very small prints, and the only clear tracks were going up a steep incline, so it could have just been a black bear trying to grip the sand. That night, it's outside the shack. We hear it walking around. We hear it sniffing the walls from the outside. There's a small porch off the front of the shack. We hear it walking there. We shout to no avail. This is where it sinks in that we are in big trouble with this bear. It has absolutely no fear of us at all. None at all. It doesn't care about the noise. It doesn't care that there are several of us. It doesn't care that the camp smells of our piss and smoke. It has learned that these things are not a threat to it. It has learned that this place has food and that these sounds and behaviors are signals that more food has been brought here and that it has become available. It's October in the Arctic. This boy is ready to give a few final big meals in before finding a den for the winter. He is not leaving. All night, that bear circles the shack. Uncle tries to sleep, but can hear the bear sniffing his head from two inches away through the plywood in ten. Dad sleeps. Bear action increases and becomes more daring as the night goes on. Uncle and I try to sleep a bed as well, but it's on and off and light. As the wee morning hours settle in, the bear becomes more aggressive, chuffing clapping his teeth, pacing around the shack, pacing the porch, sniffing the door, and sometimes standing and peering into the windows. It's dark. All we can see is a dark shape out there in the shadows. Uncle and I agree to let Dad sleep as much as possible now. He is our best shooter, and we want him to be well-rested for the inevitable shutdown that's coming at dawn, like some horrible Wild West movie. Finally, it's time to begin. The bear is ready. It starts trying to open the door. The door only has a wire and two nails holding it shut. Skookum, hardware, to be sure, 
but nonetheless warning. It's dark inside the shack, so every time the bear finds an edge to grip onto with its teeth and tries to pull the door open, the wood flexes and lets in a flash of white morning light around the doorframe. I'll never forget that. It's pulling a few times, losing its grip, getting a better grip, then pulling again. Flash, flash, flash. Pause. Flash, 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 flash. Trying to open the door and get to us, our food and whatever. Dad is up by now, of course, miffed about missing all the evening excitement, but ready to take care of all this. We have a quick exchange between the three of us in which we all quickly agree with great resignation and disappointment that we need to take this animal's life. We have never killed a bear. We never wanted to. We love bears. They're such beautiful and powerful animals. To see a big, healthy bear, all fat with a shiny coat, roaming its natural habitat, it's a sign that the entire ecosystem and food chain leading up to it are healthy. There's a symbol of a healthy ecosystem and truly, incredibly, pieces of nature. But this one had been ruined. It's been fed. There's no curing this. There's no fixing this. And there's no leaving this cabin with that thing at our door. I stand at one tiny plexiglass window, uncle at the other, and dad stands at the door with his rifle, loaded and ready. There's no tin on the door, so he considers shooting through it. The bear hears him and has dropped back to all fours and is sniffing the base of the door now. I'm helping Dad line up the shot to its head. Suddenly, it swings its head up and walks the few feet over to my window. It stands and I find myself staring face to face with a big, fat black bear with small brown eyes with very small pupils staring back at me, inches away with nothing but plexi between us. I'm staring into this thing's eyes, and I'm imagining this all going wrong. It's hurting me and devastating my mother. It's hurting my dad and devastating me. And for the first time in my life, I feel the fight response from fight or flight or freeze mode. I feel rage. The fucking audacity of this animal to not fuck off when we fucking told it to. How dare you? How fucking dare you? I bare my teeth in a snarl, jerk towards it suddenly, screaming at it and slamming my hands against the window frame to make one big jarring motion and noise. It didn't even flinch. Not even a blink. Just stared back. Deadpan. Yeah. This guy is broken. He drops back down and sniffs the door. Sniffs around where he'd left scraps the day before. That we had cleaned up, of course. Moving a foot away, a few more feet, just over by the woodpile. Now. Dad steps out onto the porch in all his glory, wearing nothing but his boxers, his boots, and his glasses. He raises the rifle and shoots hitting what must have been the lungs. The bear drops. Immediately, it tries to stand again. It manages to stand on its back legs, but the front of its body and its face are still laying on the ground, and it's trying to drag itself upwards. Second shot. Down. Use a wide circle to get in close, behind the head and away from the paws. Final shot into the back of the skull. We tag it and sit down for a bit and make some coffee to process the event before processing the bear. We will have to take the skull and full hide for the COs to check over, but we don't eat bear due to the parasites. It's illegal to leave the body, but we kind of have to, but it feels horrible, wasteful and dirty. Like we were taking trophies off this thing that should never have ended up like this. I can't remember if I had any tears over it that day, but I suddenly felt, and probably did later on once the adrenaline had worn off. The whole thing was just so sad and unavoidable. Dad and Uncle and I talked about how 
This all was due to human activity in the first place, trying to reassure ourselves that we can't be held responsible for the actions of others. We can only try to be as reasonable and responsible for ourselves as we can. We end up dragging the black bear a few hundred feet behind the shack. We won't be staying there for more than two more days and wolves are known to frequent that area. So we felt confident that we'd be off everyone's menu until it was time to break the camp. Wolves defending an easy meal means free security in the area. And as long as we don't bother each other, we're happy to just keep a few hundred feet of trees between us. The rest of the trip goes fine. We got our moose, uneventful aside that. A CO camping the boat launch comes to check our tags, so we tell him the whole story about the bear. Having a tag negates the need for that, but considering the circumstances and our own sense of shame and our involvement, we wanted to make sure we got everything into the open. They need to track stuff like problem bears and the human behavior that creates them and test the skull for various diseases to ensure the behavior isn't due to something else that may be affecting the population. They reassured us that we did everything right in the shitty circumstances we found ourselves in. Let us know where to turn in the hide and skull and even returned the hide to us later. We weren't sure how else to treasure what was left of that bear, and we wanted to keep the memory of the risks, the dangers, and the responsibilities we face when we are out there. But, ugh, that behavior. Total confidence around humans like that is so unnatural. It almost didn't feel like a real bear, but not in the maybe it's rabid way. Just a, it knows, it knows. I can't do shit to it, kind of way. This is a true story. First, some background. Manaway, Ohio is a railroad town boasting a creepy town center with an old railway station surrounded by a rural landscape peppered with brick buildings, sprawling properties with dense woods and cornfields, guarded by sunny farmhouses of varying age and size. 44S runs one lane each direction. I made this drive regularly to visit my then boyfriend. Familiar with this area, I would usually have music on, enjoying the drive and the fresh air. One day in the middle of summer in 2011, I was driving on 44S into Manaway, making my usual trip into the mid-afternoon on a beautiful clear day. I passed a quiet area just a few miles back from my destination. On the right, houses on two to three acres, lots of big front yards, longer driveways and attached garages, shaded by tall trees with thick foliage with backyards full of dense woods. On the left, across the road, there is a cornfield bordered by a deep grassy drainage culvert stretching several miles long. I see something that looks off up ahead. It's hard to make out, but there's something on the opposite side of the road where the cornfields are. It's a ways off and hard to make out, but it's clearly a large brown hairy mass right next to the road. It's too dark in color to be a dead deer. Maybe an escaped cow? No, not that either. Something about this mass on the side of the road is unlike anything I had ever seen, and I just can't figure it out because I keep having to look back at the road. Maybe whatever it is isn't roadkill and it's just an animal grazing on the side of the road into the culvert. I rode my window down to get a better look. I slowed down just a little bit as I passed by and all at once I realized what I am seeing. The hairy mass is a dead dog being eaten by another dog. 
the biggest dog I've ever seen with the freakiest, emptiest eyes. As I pass by, this thing pulls its face out of the dog carcass it's eating to look up at my car and locks eyes with me. They looked right through me, and it felt like what I can only describe as pure evil. I pass it in my car about 40 miles per hour. As I started to freak out and roll up my window, I checked my mirror for a double take because I absolutely do not believe what I saw and I see that its head is already back down again, eating and out of view with no other defining features. It was totally unbothered by my car. I slowed down, then sped up, then slow down, then speed up again. I want to know what I saw, but I completely freak out. I look for the nearest driveway up on my right, maybe 50 to 75 yards away, and peel into the driveway to turn around and go back. As I put my car in park, I see that a man is home and is sitting in a lawn chair outside his garage, faced parallel to the road, blissfully unaware of what's just up the road behind him, while his two Labradors amble around him. He sees me and assumes I'm just using his driveway to turn around but is unsettled when I drove almost all the way up the driveway, park my car, and get out, still freaking out. Take your dogs inside. You need to get inside your house. I tell him what I saw, and he gets up out of his lawn chair to look where I'm pointing, but the trees at the edge of his property block the scene from view, and it's just a bit too far. I get back in my car and keep warning him to get his dogs inside. If our places had been exchanged, I probably would have called the cops on the someone who came ripping into my driveway, rambling about some wild animal in a panic. I was terrified and full of adrenaline, with no regard for ruining this guy's peaceful afternoon. I don't remember how I left it with him, but I got back in the car backed out onto 44, and I headed back north from the way I came to get a better look at this thing, still from the safety of my moving car. I pass where it was, and it's gone. I drive back and forth one more time in disbelief at the whole thing. Further back that I thought to be safe thinking, I'd underestimated the distance between the carcass and the house I stopped at. But there was a hole in the corn where whatever this thing was had clearly drugged the dog it was eating to finish away from the road. I remember sitting, stopped on the side of the road after turning around again and headed back south, looking across the road at this hole in the corn that looked far too innocent to do justice to what I had just seen. No one driving by would even notice it. I had my head on a swivel around my car and locked by doors, but something told me I wouldn't see it again and to get out of there, so I did. When I passed the house again, the man and the dogs weren't in the yard anymore and the garage was closed. Completely rattled, I called my then boyfriend whose house I was heading to, as I drove away. But if I remember correctly, he didn't answer. When I got there, I was so shaken up and couldn't make sense of what I had seen. This was right after high school, and he still lived with his folks in a cold, creaky farmhouse in Ravina that they had just moved into. It was just a few towns over, and I did not feel safe in that house that night. It brought back all my childhood fears of being afraid of the dark and what was under the bed, like it could be anywhere. I remember this like it was yesterday, and even though I've shared this story with a few friends, I've never written it down. Whatever this was, was built like a dog, but bigger than any dog I'd ever seen. It was very dark brown with dirty hair. I've considered that it might have been a black bear with mange, but even though I only get a quick glimpse, it didn't move like a bear. And the piercing eyes in broad daylight, those were something else. It was canine. 
not Bigfoot or any of the other common myths that I'm aware of. Maybe someone here will know. I haven't done too much research into what it could have been because I think part of me is scared to know what it could be. Black dog, werewolf, I have no idea. It was big, at least 200 pounds, maybe bigger. The dog it was eating was also quite large. I'm a skeptic. To this day, this is the only unexplainable creepy thing I've ever ever seen with my own two eyes that truly shook me to my core. For months, I could not stop thinking about it, and it still scares and disturbs me to tell the story. There's weird stuff out there in the rural Midwest. Apologies for my formatting, it's late and my head's a mess. I'll try to go back and clean it up a bit later. If anyone has any idea what this thing could have been, I'm open. For suggestions. This happened about four years ago now. I just remembered it today and realized I still don't know how to explain it. I worked a swing shift and it was 11 p.m. to midnight when I got home. My dog was in the backyard. I went inside and took off my shoes right away, getting ready to take a shower. However, my dog started barking frantically. This was common for him as he was protective. I would check if there was actually a problem, every time, just in case. I went out on the deck in the backyard. He was barking at the bottom of the stairs, facing away from me, which was unusual for him to do. I started talking and he stopped barking immediately. Then I heard very loud, heavy breathing. I thought it was my dog panting, but it was not. The sound seemed to come from above me and he was standing below me. It sounded like someone hyperventilating, like they were trying to breathe as loudly as possible. I could not see anything out of the ordinary. Well, I decided to investigate. I went down the stairs and examined my yard and the next door neighbors. This was a suburban area. When I got near where I heard the breathing, I suddenly heard the sound from a few yards further away. Once I got to that yard, the sound jumped to the next yard. Being young and dumb, I continued down the street. Every time I got close, the sound would jump. It always sounded the same. It was the same loudness and pitch, always the same distance away. I continued down the road until I reached a bend. My feet hurt, so I stopped for a minute. I realized that due to the curve, I could not see the place where I heard the sound, but it seemed to be just within the edges of a wooded area. I was seriously considering chasing after it. When it occurred to me how foolish it was to be investigating alone like that, especially without shoes on. My phone was dead. I suddenly felt like I was a prey animal and some kind of predator was trying to lure me too farther away. I immediately turned and walked back as quickly as possible. Probably it was just anxiety from being alone in the dark, but I could not stop thinking that something terrible would have happened if I went any further. I never heard that sound again or had any weird experiences like that. I no longer live in that area. The best mundane answer I have is that it was a bird of some kind. What is most creepy to me? is I have since read other stories of people following a noise and then had a feeling of something luring them into the woods. I know a lot of these stories are probably either not true or have simple explanations. If someone has suggestions for what I heard, I would love to hear them. This was in the U.S., by the way, in the Midwest.
and that their listeners brings a close to these true backwood creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Interscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Buzz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. For without you, there would not be a me, and there would never be a Back to Ashes. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>